being with us. Um, yeah, the first of the new year, and hopefully we're going to keep these up uh, throughout the year. You might see some other faces presenting as well, but we're really keen to get the 101 series uh, up and running again. Uh, so yeah, just a quick introduction to, to Open Athens or Athens as we were known uh, in the past. Uh, we've been providing services to the academic and research community for over two decades now. I think it's 26 years in total. Uh, and our core mission has remained relatively unchanged in that time, uh, and that's to remove barriers to content. Despite being uh, ancient in technology terms, we remain the leaders in this uh, rather very niche space. Uh, before we talk about the types of user journeys you, sh you should pay attention to, I think we should briefly discuss why they're so important and ultimately uh, why Open Athens exists. So before, I thought to provide this timeline as I think it's a good depiction of the journey publishers, uh, us and libraries have been through over the past 40 odd years. I also think it highlights where some of the challenges we face arise from. Much of the world is still heavily reliant on proxy services and IP based authentication, uh, as well as using VPNs. Uh, and while these will likely still have a place for a little while yet, uh, we have our own proxy. Uh, they are aging technologies that were never designed for authentication in the first place. I think it's also interesting to see that SAML is still the standard for authentication, despite being over two decades old. Uh, its age may go some way to explaining why it's still pretty complex for, for many people. And this is really why we exist. It's, uh, if single sign-on was simple, if SAML was easy, we may not have a place in this world at all. Uh, SAML is, is a great toolbox uh, with most of what we need, but it's a different story when it comes to using those tools effectively. And that's because users don't see an XML file. They see a website they want to get access to. Uh, so the user experience is as crucial as getting that underlying technology right. So yeah, as our technology is, and others has matured over the past few decades, it's important to bear in mind the change in user behavior in that time. We all, know have, we all now have a digital identity, or in most cases, we have several. And with that, there are dozens of services all vying for our attention. Um, one element of increasing that engagement is through personalization. Recommended content and search history are all key to increasing the time users spend on your site, but also providing them with real value. And there's no reason to believe these concepts don't be, can't be applied to, to academic publishing, and indeed they are. Unlike services like Facebook and Google, uh, SAML can provide a pseudonymous profile for a user and protecting their user data. Even as a student about 10 years ago, I was told to see myself as a customer, paying for a service um, with that my education. Uh, so this does add additional pressure to libraries and publishers. So getting the user journey right can have a huge impact on the user's experience. And social media has come to the fore since our inception. And these tweets really highlight how important it is to make your platform as user-friendly as possible. Users will give up more easily when they have access to the world's information at their fingertips. If users can't get access to content by a legitimate route, it impacts both the library and the publisher. And all of this is to go to explain the importance of a good user journey and how that shouldn't be underplayed. So here are the three key user journeys. Hopefully you can read the text on the screen. Uh, so yeah, the three key user journeys to consider, uh, this is both for libraries and publishers when it comes to implementing federated authentication. So first and foremost, navigating the main website. And by that, we mean the publisher website. This journey is what can really differentiate SSO through SAML against the proxy solution, having the ability to log in with your university credentials on any website you have a subscription with. I listened in to a library webinar a couple of weeks ago with some technical colleges in the US where they were discussing just how important this function is. And we often hear from students as well about how important it is to be able to easily and seamlessly log into a publisher's website directly. Secondly, we've got navigating the library website. So librarians will go to great lengths to ensure users have access to all the information they need when they need it. Library portals are often a huge investment for a library. So ensuring your platform works with Wafeless or access URLs can enhance the experience and make it more likely your platform will be front and center on the library website. Finally, discovery services and deep linking. Uh, discovery services are often um, integrated into user flows on library websites. You'll often see, for example, EBSCO Discovery integrated on library portals. So ensuring a user can access an article they find without jumping through hoops or having to log in consistently uh, is a function that is underutilized, but, but very important. So we'll start with the simplest, navigating the publisher website. There are two key things to consider here. The first of which is your WAIF or where are you from? 
with, with Open Athens uh, and SAML more widely, authentication, i.e. who is the user, is done by the library and publishers do the authorization, i.e. what can they access. So you need to direct the user to authenticate at their organization because you do not save their credentials on your system. A good way for experience can make a huge difference. There is a great variance in how they look and function, but there are off the shelf options available. Open Athens has the Wayfinder, which is a white labeled product, which is free of charge. Uh, and we have the seamless access one too, which we'll touch on a little bit shortly. People do build their own, uh, but the important thing to take away is the consistency and the standardization uh, across the board. Having something dynamic rather than having a list, for example, is, is really important to get it right. So again, the best guidance with your wave is to avoid lists at all costs. Uh, and we are still seeing large lists of uh, organizations and libraries. So large publishers may have many thousands of customers. So it's not logical to ask a user to look down a long list to find their organization just to log in. Unfortunately, we're also still seeing lists of federations too, which within themselves will contain a list of organizations. Uh, and most users will never know which federation they're a part of and there's indeed no naming convention for them either they can often be named after an acronym um so yeah no kind of uh, no link to the, the country they're based in at all so uh, it's important to, to use uh, universal language uh, and avoid listing federations we must remember that a researcher may visit several dozen websites in one session so if they encounter one type of wave rather than several dozen it's quite easy to see why standardizing that experience can really add value and make it a better user experience. Getting to the WAIF is also key. Uh, so simply providing the sign-in button in a consistent location, uh, and we recommend the top right can, can make a big difference. So it's also a good idea to group access options, uh, specifically when it comes to Open Athens and Shibboleth. Again, a user wouldn't necessarily know which federation they're a part of, and they often wouldn't know which technology their organization is using either. Most of our library customers plug into us uh, via their own IDP. So for example, Microsoft ADFS or Azure AD. So a lot of the time users won't even be interacting with us directly. So they won't necessarily know whether it's Open Athens or Shibboleth. So again, generic and standard language such as access to your institution is preferred here. You know, what lies behind that button is not information that the user needs to know. So yeah, Shibboleth and Open Athens, uh, I mean, probably the most common question we have when somebody comes across us for the first time is, you know, what's the difference between you and Shibboleth? Uh, they are essentially the same thing. Uh, the biggest difference between us and, and Shibboleth is we are a, a fully managed service with a dedicated team. Uh, there is help out there for Shibboleth, for sure, um, but it's, uh, it's open source software, free at the point of use, but generally involves a lot more development work uh, behind the scenes. So if you support one, you support the other, but you don't have to treat us differently on your site. Uh, the terms along with um, these terms, along with kind of federations, federated access, uh, are all kind of used interchangeably. Uh, so I think it really does help to kind of treat us as, as the same uh, with some subtle differences, um, which differentiate us from each other. So yeah, we did briefly mention this. So this, as we're talking about waves, uh, I should mention seamless access, uh, an initiative we've been heavily involved with. Um, it was mo almost exclusively created to address that user experience problem across the industry. Um, so, you know, there are many different types of waves across the board. So it aims to standardize that wave and login journey when you go directly to a publisher's website. Uh, and if you haven't explored it already, it is well worth uh, exploring. Um, I think initially it looked like it may be aimed at uh, just the major publishers, the big STEM publishers, and it made some librarians quite un uneasy about the thought of these publishers getting together to create a new service. But it's been rolled out across the board now with great success. Um, and, and it isn't just for those STEM publishers. So urging both publishers and librarians to get involved. Um, yeah, everybody who's implemented it up to now has seen some, some massive increases in engagement and usage, which is good for both, obviously both libraries and publishers and the users themselves. Uh, and we can, of course, you know, we, we can help you support Seamless Access. Again, it's a, it's a free service, Seamless Access. It's an industry-led initiative. Uh, but if you need additional support with, with implementing it, we can, we can absolutely help you there. And our own Wayfinder does support Seamless Access as well. So there's a second part to that signing in via the publisher's website. Um, so, you know, what if a user finds you via a Google search uh, or via reading list? Uh, every page on your site should provide clear signposting about where a user can log in to read the article. And at Open Athens, we follow the three click rules. So if you can see in this example, click the PDF. And then if you look towards the bottom of the page, it provides some access options. Again, some more access options you can see here, 
the options that aren't grouped, and then a list of federations. So again, more than three clicks. So we recommend following the three click rule. And again, if you have any issues around user experience, this is where we'd like to help you. Um, whether it's just through through the support through the support desk, but we also have a health check service where we can go through this sort of thing to help you make improvements to your to your user journey. And we, you know, if you use a platform provider, we urge you to get in touch with them. But generally, they're pretty good at abiding by this three click rule. Um, but again, most of the industry, there there are some small improvements that we can made uh, that can be made to that have a massive difference. And again, yeah, this is the same challenge that I've seen the is trying to address. Uh, so you may have seen this, you know, Science Direct, American Chemical Society are two of the early adopters. Uh, you, you'll notice that, that that standardized login button front and center on the article. Uh, so yeah, clearly signposted. You don't have to go looking up and down the page. Uh, it's, uh, oh, they often use dynamic buttons as well. So we'll have the, the name of your organization saved in the button. Uh, but again, this goes a long way to standardizing that user journey. If you're going to multiple different sites in your research journey and they all have this dynamic button in the middle of the page, you can just imagine how much more seamless that would be as compared to going up and down pages and trying to find sign-in buttons through different types of services. So I think I'm going to hand over to Adam now. So hopefully he's still here because I don't have his video on. Are you there, Adam? Indeed. Hello. Okay, so I'll hand over to you. Just let me know if you want me to change the slides. Thank you. Yeah, so now just going to try and go into a bit, not too much detail, still relatively high level, uh, but just a bit deeper into the concept of deep linking and waifless linking. Uh, so just to recap, waif is where are you from? It's basically that, that point where you get to a, a service provider, a vendor, and you, you try and initiate a login, you need to find your org in order to log in. That's navigating the WAIF. Um, WAIF loss links are basically negating the need to go through that uh, organization search. And deep linking is the concept of getting to a particular URL, basically a particular web page or website, so an ebook or journal level. So whilst um, service providers, publishers, will do IP recognition by default. So if you use like a generic URL to some form of um, vendor website and you're on site, on network, on prem, uh, then typically they'll probably just give you access without the need to do any form of authentication. Um, but that kind of thing, like if you're remote, so I don't know, studying in Starbucks or at home is pretty much we all are now. Um, what service providers don't do is automatically detect whether you're logged in with your single sign on system, be that Azure, Open Athens, Shibboleth, whatever. So um, if people go to a generic link, they'll always have to navigate the WAIF. Now, as we know, yes, Google, other search engines are available, but it's a pretty big powerhouse. Most people get to most things through Google. But that's not the only way people get there. A lot of people, uh, certainly um, organizations, will try and curate links to promote and provide easy access to their students, their patrons, their users. Um, so that could be anything from a reading list, a uh, discovery service, um, a, a, just a simple library portal. Um, now, with discovery services especially, people sometimes painstakingly search uh, or curate these searches to find content. The worst thing is when you've done all that search, you click a link to a particular journal, and then you're you have to like navigate a waif so you're not seamlessly taken there and then you're just dumped at the home page that's a terrible user experience which uh, we and publishers uh, alike get lots of uh, complaints about so as a publisher build these deep linking and waifless capabilities in it's all about the user experience uh, next kieran please so this is what we're talking about as an example, um, like with, uh, what did I say? Um, 
a reading list or a library portal, this is an example of a discovery service. So you've found a particular thing, be it an article, a journal, an ebook. And we click the link. Uh, and what we expect is to seamlessly be taken in. So in this example, the user was already signed in to their single sign on system. So seamlessly, they were taken into a, a clinical key. In the top left, you, you might see CKN, so they're recognized as a member of that organization. And uh, on that right thing, you can see they're taken to the precise journal that they, they uh, wanted to get access to. Next. So if you were to provide like a generic link or you didn't support deep linking, next, and you click a link to JAMA in this example, then you're basically taken to a page where you've either got to search for your federation, which nobody knows about. Sometimes it lists the technology that the service provider is using, be it Shibboleth or Open Athens. Instead, it would be better if that link took you straight there, which is uh, depicted by that last um, picture, where you're, you're taken straight into JAMA and recognized as a member of Queensland Health. Uh, next, I think I might have one more. I think that's all your slides. Adam. Oh, okay, fine. Yeah. So, the, so in summary, um, there there's lots of things that that could be improved on a service provider or vendor websites. Um, the organization discovery piece or the login. Uh, piece, how how that's displayed, what the user experience is. Um, use consistent terminology. Uh, try not to talk about technology. Um, allow type ahead searches when you think that there's hundreds of thousands of organizations all around the world having to go through a drop down. It's terrible. But also think about um, those users that aren't starting their journey from your website. Think about those that are coming from a library portal from a discovery service um, and uh, ensure that they have capability to seamlessly link um, to your service with ease. So Adam, I've, I actually have a question before we move on. So, mm. so, we, so obviously we know from experience that how valuable and powerful deep linking can be, but there's still quite a few publishers that don't support it. Sometimes it's because they physically can't or it doesn't fit their service. But so, so what do you think the key blockers are behind implementing deep linking? And do you have any kind of advice and guidance around them supporting it if they don't already? Um, yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, more often than not, uh, I think it's a lack of understanding. Uh, either they they think that, that their particular app, it, it, it's uh, not applicable for deep linking. Because say that they, if you've got a, an app where it's almost like software on a on a PC, but in a browser where there is there is no concept of different web pages or URLs, it's like an applet type thing. In in that case, you can't really do deep linking because there aren't URLs or specific web pages. So that's a valid reason, but that doesn't mean you can't do waifless, as in provide an organization specific login url so yeah most people um don't build it because they don't think they need it or or that it's relevant or they don't necessarily appreciate the the user experience hit that they take um but it is a it is clearly more of a concern for um for want of a better term librarians information managers that kind of people because they are largely taking the brunt of all of the support tickets that that may get raised uh, by by students users patrons um beyond the understanding piece yeah sometimes it's old technology so either people have left and they don't know how to update it or, or build capability um, or it's such old technology that it generally needs refactoring and it's just a huge 
uh, both time and money expense. That's uh, obviously a, a legitimate reason to um, carefully think about planning uh, that kind of work. But ultimately, generally, personal opinion, I would I would argue, I don't think there's any legitimate excuse not to build deep linking uh, or waveless support into an application. Controversial opinion. Thanks, Adam. Mm. <laughs> That's me. <laughs> um, so yeah, the, the last few, sl few slides now. So yeah, as we've discussed, uh, discovery services uh, and deep linking, it's worth giving a shout out to, to get FTR. Um, we're less involved with this than we might be with seamless access. Um, but you know, as we're heavily invested in the health of the industry, um, it seems like a very good service. Uh, it clearly signposts content that is supported through a subscription, so you don't have to hit dead ends when going through these discovery services. It clearly tells you whether you have access or not. Um, I believe it's a paid service. Uh, I'm not actually too sure, to be honest. Um, but I think there's been, uh, I think from, from the STM Association, I think there's been a a spin-off who, who manages get FTR. But um, yeah, by all means, have a quick look into it. Um, it supports IP when on site and, and SAML off site. So we, you know, we do have a part to play in that. Um, but uh, apologies, I don't actually know a huge amount about it at this point, but I'll certainly do some more research um, uh, as I think you should too. So uh, just a quick summary. So yeah, get your wave right. Um, there's lots of off the shelf solutions. Uh, we would recommend Wayfinder or the Seamless Access uh, Wave uh, because they abide by the same standards. Uh, people do build their own, but there's uh, too much kind of variance in, in that. Uh, and it, you know, it's time consuming and expensive. Uh, avoid lists. So yeah, we're still seeing lists of federations out there and listing customers. Uh, it's not intuitive. So avoid lists, use a dynamic search tool if you can, like Wayfinder. Uh, Open Athens and Shiblet should be treated the same. Uh, it might not, it might sound kind of um, a strange for us to, to not want our branding on the website, but please treat Shibboleth and Open Athens as something more generic like institutional login. Um, yeah, as, as Adam said, you know, implement deep linking. We hear from librarians every day uh, about their frustrations when it's not available when it should be. Um, yes, it, it does require some investment, but it's well worth that. And we have some kind of helpful tips, guidance we can provide to, to get you up to speed with it. Um, and yeah, and think about the user journey across the web, not just your own site. So, you know, when we talk about standards and we talk about consistency, you know, just put yourself in the, in the eyes of a student who's going to multiple sites in one day. You know, one of the issues we had when SAML was, uh, was, was like kind of the release into the world is that there was no kind of oversight. So, you know, although it's a standard approach to authentication, there was no kind of oversight on how it was implemented. Um, so, you know, marketing get involved and they want their website to look different from their competitors. But, you know, in this space, it does actually help to be consistent and use some standards across the board. So yeah, just think about that user journey between sites. Uh, seamless access and get FTR do solve some of the issues and UX is, is a huge issue. Uh, the only reason the seamless access exists really is because the issues around that kind of non-consistency with user experience. And it isn't just reserved for, for the big STEM publishers. I think some of the communications initially made it sound like it may be just for those big STEM publishers. They were the ones who were involved and invested from early on. Uh, but you know, librarians are on board with it now. So you know, humanities-based publishers and, and non-kind of academic journal sites as well should get on board with seamless access. I think the health of the industry relies on it, and, and that just improves your um, your chances of being successful as well. Uh, and just a, a small plug at the end: uh, we do have a health check service. So if you're concerned about any of your kind of user experiences, any of these user journeys we've discussed today, uh, we can run a health check service for you. Make sure everything's in place and offer recommendations off that and also help you implement any, any recommendations through our support team and, and consultancy. So that's it from, uh, from me and Adam and Cynthia. I don't know if we have any questions, Cynthia. Thank you very much, Kieran <laughs> and Adam. Uh, so if you have any questions, please pop them into the Q&A uh, panel. Uh, we're gonna wait a couple of minutes to see if everyone um, if anyone has any questions, um, but otherwise, if we finished the webinar and you just remembered something that you wanted to ask us, uh, you can get in touch with us to through contact at openathens.net. Uh, I can pop that in the chat panel right now.
But yeah, I'll give a couple of minutes for people to type in their questions. Shall we plug Access Lab over here? Oh, we can. <laughs> Go for it, Kieran. Oh, I, I was hoping you would. I didn't know the details. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, yeah, so we are uh, going to have Access Lab. I think the registrations are open already. Mm -hmm. Um, we also can send you a link with the registration page and uh, some more information about the, uh, the program. Um, I don't think the program has gone live yet. Oh, very good, Adam. Thank you. But we'll definitely give you some more information on the email um, that will be going out. Um, for everyone with the recording. So it's going to be on Tuesday, 22nd of March. All right, give it one more minute. Just as a question hasn't yet um, surfaced, can you go back to your summary slide, Kieran, please? So I just wanted to just add another piece about the deep linking area. So when you think, and this is directed more at um, kind of service providers, publishers, application vendors, um, if you have, invested in federated access that's great because that ultimately makes your service more easily available to people the fact that they can navigate to it and log in uh, so if someone's using let's say a proxy like a web rewriting proxy um that means you have to ha have a very specific url you can't get to your site from google and log in so federated access is great from a being able to access your your system and if you've gone so far as to invest in federated access doing waveless and deep linking is ultimately essential because if a library or other organization college university hospital whatever if they can successfully link to your service using federated methods then what they would typically resort to is uh, using some form of web rewriting proxy thus then not sending traffic to your site via the federated route so there is that to consider as well um, if you're doing like i don't know cost benefit analysis of federated access deep linking and waveless support will you'll see a lot more usage i, I suspect Great. Thank you, Adam. So no questions now. Um, I think we're okay to wrap it up. Again, if you think of any questions that you'd like to ask, uh, just get in touch with us uh, through contact at openathens.net. Uh, I've popped that in the chat panel. Um, thank you again to Kieran and Adam uh, for your presentation. And thank you, everyone who's joined us today and uh, who will be watching us in the future on YouTube. Uh, in the meantime, while we don't post uh, the recording on YouTube, uh, you can access a lot more resources on our YouTube channel there. Um, and including all the other um, installments of talking about my federation, uh, we have a playlist dedicated to it. So go check it out. Thank you very much, everyone. And hope to see you all next time. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye.